Hello and welcome to the Cheeky Science Show. In today's video, we're going to look at prime editing in plants. So prime editing is a form of genome editing that I spoke about in a previous video about the technique and how it works. But in this video, we'll look at how prime editing can now be applied to plants as reported in this recent Nature Biotechnology paper. So whilst I do have quite an elaborate and entertaining video about prime editing, I will just reintroduce the concept behind prime editing here. So prime editors are CRISPR-Cas9 nicases that are fused to a reverse transcriptase. So Cas9 normally cuts both strands of DNA, whilst the Cas9 nicase will only cut one strand. And so this is the protein part, and it's programmed with prime editing guide RNAs, otherwise known as PEG RNAs. And these recruit the Cas9 protein into the target sites that you want to have the genome edit. So I will go into the technology in a little bit more detail here, but I would advise you to watch the previous video where I go into a lot more detail if you don't fully understand the concept yet. So the overview of this video will be to explain a little bit more about the concept behind prime editing, just to give you the, the key take home messages about how it works, and then how they can apply this technology to plants and why they'd want to do it. And then I got some funky sub headings that sound a bit vague at the moment that will make complete sense when we get to it. So let's start with further explaining the concepts behind prime editing. So currently you're looking at the Cas9 nicase and this is the H840A Cas9 and so this cuts a single strand which is the non-target strand to what the guide RNA recognises and you can see that Cas9 is fused to this reverse transcriptase and you can see that in prime editing the guide RNA is actually extended such that it can bind further down the target site and contain the targeted genome edits in the sequence such that the reverse transcriptase can then copy those edits into the DNA sequence. So in other words, the guide RNA is technically the primer for the reverse transcriptase that will then transcribe the desired edits and that will then get incorporated into the genome, which is, I think, where the name prime editing comes from. Don't know why I said think, pretty sure that's the reason why it's called prime editing. But anyway, I've redrawn this out now without the Cas9 so you can just see the prime edited guide RNA sequence. And so you can see it's got the guide part at the 5' prime end, which is going to bind to the targeted genome sites and then at the three prime end you see the the prime the primer site that recognizes the similar site but just downstream and contains the desired genome edits that are wanted to be incorporated into the DNA sequence and so that's the reverse transcriptase template that will include in the edits and so in the first paper where they describe the technology of prime editing they tried different versions of this prime editing technology to see what was best and so PPE is now standing for plant prime editing because this has come from the most recent publication and you can see there's 2, 3 and 3B and these are just slight variations of the same technique but just modified in slightly different ways. The key difference is that in 3 and 3B there is an additional guide RNA that binds the sites just a little bit downstream of the target sites where it induces a nick in the non-edited strand to uh, promotes the incorporation of the edited change as opposed to the non-edited change, if that makes sense. So the development of this technology was done in mammalian cells, so the question behind this paper was could it be applied to plants? And so well, why would you want to do this? Well one reason is to accelerate crop improvement and breeding, which is to try and you know resolve this food crisis that you know there's gonna be 9.6 billion the population by 2050 and there isn't enough crops to go about. And so you can use genome editing techniques to modify the traits such as improving resistance to pathogens and improving the crop growth rates, as I elaborate a little bit more in this video about superfoods. And then secondly, the current techniques we have to edit plants is quite challenging. So when using the canonical Cas9 genome editing system, you induce a double strand break in the targeted site. And so in cells, there are two main mechanisms for repairing double strand breaks, non-homologous end joining, which is a error prone method, or a more precise method, which is homology directed repair, which depends upon a donor template that contains the desired change. 
So implants, there is a twofold problem, one being that tomology-directed repair has a lower efficiency than seen in mammalian cells, and secondly, there's difficulty with delivering the DNA templates containing the desired edits. So this was the motivation behind prime editing, where you don't have any double tram breaks and you don't need the donor DNA templates. So that is all good and well, but how do you actually modify prime editing to be able to use it in plants? So that was the aim of the paper, and so they effectively optimised prime editing via a variety of changes in the codon, the promoter, and also in editing conditions, which we'll come back to a little bit later. And they trialled these different conditions to see where editing was best. So that's including the most efficient and with the lowest amount of undesired changes. And so initially they used a reporter system to be able to see where editing is occurring effectively. And this reporter system is a fluorescence-based system whereby you want to edit a blue fluorescent protein into a green fluorescent protein. And then you can detect the fluorescence colour. Not, I mean, I put colour, but you know what I mean. And so if editing is successful, you by changing just one codon from CAC to TAC, you turn this blue protein into a green protein. And so the number of cells that are green gives you a readout on the editing efficiency. So I've taken this figure from the paper, and so you can see that they have a negative control and a positive control where they've just got cells that are always express a green fluorescent protein. And then if you look at some of the other conditions, so the first one is actually a plant-based editor. I'll explain base editing in a little bit. It's just another alternative editing system. And then the PPE3B is the prime editing system that they're trying to modify. And you can see that 4.4% roughly have of the cells are green. So that gives you a readout of the editing efficiency. So to go from a blue fluorescent protein to a green one, that requires a substitution in the nucleotide sequence. But what about editing and including other genetic modifications? So to examine this in prime editing on plants, they moved to endogenous genes in rice and wheat, and they tested to see if they could include six base pair deletions, three base pair insertions, and single nucleotide modifications. For example, going from cytosine to thymine. So just to mention some of the editing efficiencies they achieved with these modifications, they got around an 8.2% success rate with the deletions, around 2% with the insertions. And they also did see some success with the single nucleotide changes. And so this last one is very similar to what can currently be achieved with base editing techniques, which, as I mentioned, is an alternative genome editing technique that doesn't include any breaks in the genome. And it can currently do cytosine to thymine, guanine to adenine, adenine to guanine, and thymine to cytosine. So, so far, the editing efficiencies for using base editing for these changes is higher than using the prime editing technique, but what really makes prime editing stand out is its versatility and ability to incorporate many different types of changes, whereas base editing is much more limited. So we've now talked all about that base, and now it's time to move on to some like it's hot. So in addition to optimising the editing of the core components of the system, they also tested the editing conditions, and one thing they tested was the temperature. And so as you can see in this figure here, they saw a greater percentage of desired edits at a higher temperature. So some like it's hot, I guess. <laughs> a bit unnecessary. Anyway, now onto a bit of A-level biology. How well does this editing technique work in actual plants as opposed to just testing the system? So the main challenge is actually getting the prime editing components into the plants. And to do that, they use agrobacteria-mediated transformation, which turns out is something I learned at GCC or A-level. But anyway, agrobacterium is a bacterium and it infects plants. And when it does this, it transfers some of its own DNA into the infected plant cell's DNA. And this can be exploited to get the DNA encoding the prime editing system into the plants. So what you do is you have the DNA construct that expresses the Cas9 protein needed for prime editing, along with the different guide RNAs. And the idea is to put this genetic construct into agrobacterium, and then the agrobacterium can then infect and input this DNA into the plant cell, and then the plant will then express this Cas9 prime editing system, and hopefully, as you would hope, to edit and achieve the desired genome editing in the plant. 
So the team did this and tested deletion substitutions and multinucleotide substitutions, and they had some success, which is awesome. So just before the video finishes, we'll do a quick roundup of the key take-home messages of this publication. So the main aim of this publication was to achieve prime editing and adapt it to be able to use it in plants. And they did this um, by testing a variety of different types of editing. And to do this, they had to optimise the system, not only by the guide RNA design, but also the editing conditions as we discussed with temperature. So plant prime editing was able to achieve a variety of different types of edits. However, it was slightly less efficient than the current base editors for transition point mutations. But again, you have to remember that prime editing is a lot more flexible. And so I think there's still work to be done in optimising the system for plants, but as stated in the last sentence of this publication, the fast utility of plant prime editing has the potential to advance both plant breeding and functional genomics research. So it'll be exciting to see how plant prime editing is used in the future. And so, as always, thank you for listening.